Copyright law and contract law can be super complicated, and most artists end up getting screwed over by the labels and suits because they don't know the law. What advice would you give to anyone who wants to become a singer? Um, get a good lawyer. Historically, labels and big businesses use the law to get artists and creatives into bad contracts, take ownership of the masters, reap the lion's share of profits, and have control of how the artist's work is used for life. As Prince once famously said, if you don't own the masters, then the masters own you. Taylor Swift was only 15 years old when she originally signed a contract with the label Big Machine Records and signed away the rights to her masters forever. She could have avoided this disaster altogether had she known contract law, copyright law, entertainment law, licensing law, and music law, all by age 15 of course. Brand. Fortunately for Taylor, she had the brains and brawn, pun intended, to take back ownership of her masters and her future by re-recording her first six albums. She recently released 1989 Taylor's version, her fourth re-recorded album, and is now on the Eras Tour selling out stadiums worldwide and performing all of her old songs. So it's the perfect time to rehash this beef. Welcome to the Eras Tour! Mike! Yo, Mike! Oh, oh yeah! So, how bad were Taylor's contracts with Big Machine Records? What is copyright law? Is Scooter Braun actually evil? And how is Taylor Swift legally allowed to re-record her albums and take control of her future? Let's get into it. But first, let's cover some backstory on why Taylor is doing all this to begin with. Like most budding artists, Taylor didn't have the resources to start up on her own and wasn't informed about the law. In 2005, Taylor Swift signed a 13-year recording deal with Big Machine Records to produce six albums. Taylor Swift, Fearless, Speak Now, Red, 1989, and Reputation. As part of the contract, Big Machine Records gained perpetual ownership of the masters in exchange for a cash advance and the resources for Taylor to produce and release her albums. But also, she was an unknown talent at the time meaning she didn't have much bargaining power either way. Fast forward 13 years later to 2018, Taylor is a huge star. Her catalog is worth hundreds of millions. Her contract with Big Machine Records, BMR, is expiring, and she wants to buy back all her old masters in exchange for re-signing with BMR, as well as have the rights to her future master recordings with the label. I know you're probably tired of hearing me say masters, 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 by now, but this is the core of the legal battle. So let's take a beat. What is a master? No, no, not like that master. A master is the most authentic supersonic account of the song. So why is owning the masters important? Every time the songs from the master recordings are put on disc, streamed, downloaded or licensed to TV, movie or live events, the owner of the masters gets the highest profit. Masters are basically like a masterpiece house you dreamed of building. Record labels front the cost for all the materials and construction workers. Then you're allowed to work for years on your vision, pouring in thousands thousands of hours of work that all originated from your mind until the house is a masterpiece that you always envisioned, except it's actually not your house. And you don't even get to live in it unless you agree to sell more of your soul for years on end. <laughs> Without ownership of the masters, the label would always be taking a huge cut of the profits and restrict or dictate any licensing for media like TV and movies. Plus, owning the rights to the songs adds to the label's net worth and estate not the artists. Artists are basically building equity for another person to own. And perhaps the worst part of signing bad contracts with labels is that they control when and if your music gets released at all. Now it's time for our sponsor, Surfshark. This portion of the video helps support the channel and makes my videos possible. So have a heart and stick around for the ad and for the rest of the video after the break. Huge thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. If you're like me and planning to travel the world for Taylor's The Eras Tour, then you're going to need a VPN. One of the biggest reasons you use Surfshark, especially while traveling, is to secure your online data. Surfshark is a VPN app or browser extension for your laptop, phone, or other devices. And with Surfshark, you can use one account with an unlimited number of devices. Surfshark keeps your online identity safe by encrypting all of the information sent between your device and the internet. This keeps your personal data protected from big companies and hackers. Surfshark's clean web feature blocks ads, trackers, malware, and phishing attempts, allowing you to surf the web safely. Oh, whoa! Ha, got your data, sucker! He doesn't actually have my data. <laughs> because another thing I love about Surfshark is they don't monitor, track, or store anything you do online. That means no connection or activity logs. None of your browser history or logins, you're 100% safe. You can even use free public Wi-Fi safely when you're traveling with Surfshark. They don't keep track of your online activities at all. 
Guess I won't be getting any data off your phone after all. Nope, but thanks for bringing back my phone. I kind of need it for my flight. No problem, man. But you do know that was still illegal though, right? No, I brought it back. Yep, still illegal, but I'll let it slide this once. Aw, oh, thanks, lawyer Mike. They have 3,200 plus servers in over 100 countries. This means I can place my device anywhere in the world and it lets you use that device as if you're in that country or any country. You can also access and unblock content libraries and streaming services from other countries, like all of the Netflix libraries from around the world. Surfshark liberates your internet by unblocking blocked websites and bypassing geo restrictions. It's a big wide world. Imagine all the internet you don't even know exists. Get an exclusive Surfshark Black Friday deal now. Enter promo code LAWBYMIKE to get up to six additional months free with the link in the description. Let's take a quick look at some precedents to understand how common it is for record labels to do this. Several artists have had decades long legal battles to take back control of their masters. Prince is definitely one of the biggest names that drew attention to artists controlling their own destiny. He battled his entire career against the man fighting to own his masters and also fighting for the freedom to release music when he wanted. Out of desperation, Prince even changed his name to an unpronounceable glyph. Miss guidedly hoping that his record contract may not be enforceable if he was no longer Prince. Obviously, this isn't how contract law works. And that's probably a good thing. Blech. Oh, yep, yeah, nope. No clue how to read custom Prince glyphs. The Beatles fought for decades to regain ownership of their masters. In 1989, Paul McCartney said, quote, very early on we got managed into a little situation. It meant that whatever the lion's share of the songs we did were taken from someone else. Paul tried to warn his then friend Michael Jackson about the power and necessity of owning your masters and the lucrative business side and how he'd been fighting for years to get back the rights to his masters, to which Michael replied, I'm going to buy your songs, and he did. The Beatles had become too legendary and the record label had taken most of their earnings, leaving McCartney unable to buy the songs back himself. He said, quote, the trouble is I wrote those songs for nothing and buying them back at these phenomenal sums, I just can't do it. Jackson's response to McCartney was, oh Paul, that's just business. Needless to say, but Paul and Michael weren't friends after that. Why'd you do it, little Michael? <laughs> Other examples are TLC, Kesha, Little Kim, and even JoJo who you might not even remember because her record label completely stopped her from making music for almost 10 years. JoJo signed a terrible deal when she was only 12 years old. She said, quote, we were assured that the deal was very normal and the lawyer that I was with at the time said, this is a great deal. You shouldn't look into it any deeper than it is. You're gonna be protected. Then soon after, JoJo found stardom and hit her peak the label blocked her from releasing her music entirely. Eventually, Jojo released two free mixtapes as a workaround to just getting her music out. <sighs> if only I had been there to stop Jojo and her mom from signing that deal. Hey kid, wanna sign your life away and owe me most of the money you make and do whatever I say in perpetuity? Don't worry, it's totally safe. I'm a lawyer for the label, so you'll be protected. Yeah, but you're not my lawyer. Hey, wait. Well, I tried. So the lesson is, it's crucial to own your masters, but also make sure that you're not locked into a contract that lets the record own you and dictate your future. It's extremely unusual that you'll receive a contract that's fair for both sides. Not saying that everyone's trying to screw you over. However, most times the contracts will be slanted in their favor. General rule of thumb is to always, always push back on something. Everything is negotiable. Now back to Taylor. Swift wrote for years that she had pleaded for a chance to own her own work, but instead was asked to sign a new contract with Big Machine Records that would give her the opportunity to earn one album back at a time for every new one she turned in. Now I don't have access to the entire contract. Big Machine only published this small portion, but let's break it down. Big Machine seems to agree to most of her terms, but of course, that's what they want to portray. They want to trick the casual civilian into thinking that by showing only a small section, they will assume that the rest of the contract is forthright. The company tries to sound like they did everything they could, but they still seem to only offer her ownership of her masters if she re-signed with them for 10 years. Also, nothing is said about the new albums that Taylor would record during those 10 years, except that Taylor reserves the right to exploit, not own, the new materials as long as she agrees to not make re-recordings of them ever. Finally, the contract doesn't say anything about Big Machine not being allowed to sell as soon as Taylor signed the contract and locked herself in for 10 years, which was one of her big concerns. Hey Mike, how many years did I sign up to film your YouTube videos? Don't worry, it was only like 20 years or until I transfer the rights to someone else. Wait, so I signed up with you for 20 years, but you can sell my contract to someone else before the 20 years is up? Yep, exactly. I can even sell it to your worst enemy. Quoting Taylor, I walked away because I knew once I signed that contract, Scott Borchetta would sell the label, thereby selling me and my future. 
Legally, Taylor would have been signing the contract with the entity Big Machine Records, which was currently owned by Scott Borchetta. Taylor resigning would have skyrocketed the value of the company because then she'd be forced to keep making music for whoever bought Big Music Records. <laughs> So how can Big Machine legally sell Taylor's future, or at least the next decade of it, if she signed the contract? It's called assignment law. Most record label and big business contracts will say they have the right to transfer your contract to someone else. And unless you push back and require consent required for assignment, the label has the right to sell your contract to another party, even if you hate that person or they're a bully. Artists could also try for a key man or key woman provision which means that if someone you decided to work with at the label leaves, like if you signed just to work with Jay-Z and he leaves, then you could get out of the contract. This is a big ass though, and most smaller artists will not be able to negotiate it. Hey Mike, did uh, by chance I get that provision so if you leave, I can be free? <laughs> Sorry bro, but maybe next time you'll learn to read the contract. Also, don't worry, you have plenty of time to think about your mistake. Exactly 19 years and six months by my watch. <laughs> Imagine how much controlling Taylor Swift's future for 10 years could sell for. Because Taylor was exactly correct. Soon after she refused the deal and signed with Universal, Scott Borchetta of Big Machine Records let the entire company be acquired by Scooter Braun's Ithaca Holdings for over $300 million. The acquisition included the rights and masters to Taylor's entire past catalog of record-breaking hits. Due to the fast timing of this sale, we can assume that Scott and Scooter had this planned all along. Taylor narrowly escaped being completely owned by Scooter Braun. Scooter Braun, AKA a horrible bully with years worth of receipts showing he's indeed a bully. Mr. Scooter Braun, this court finds you guilty of being a bully. However, Taylor's past albums were still owned and controlled by him for him to profit off of or even sell again. Unless negotiated, artists typically will have zero control over who the labels will sell their masters to. About the sale to Scooter, Taylor said, When I left my masters in Scott's hands, I made peace with the fact that eventually he would sell them. Never in my worst nightmares did I imagine the buyer would be Scooter, controlling a woman who didn't want to be associated with them. In perpetuity, that means forever. What Taylor meant here by in perpetuity was that the intellectual property of her masters would be controlled forever by someone else. Often, transfer of rights and other clauses can survive contract termination. Her original contract with Big Machine had a termination date, but there was an exception for ownership of her masters that extended into perpetuity and also allowed for assignment to other parties, like Scooter, who would then own the rights in perpetuity or until he decided to sell them. So it was pretty clear that Taylor wanted nothing to do with Scooter Braun, and there was plenty of evidence, I mean, receipts of his past bullying. And now that Scooter Braun controlled her future, unfortunately for Taylor, his bullying continued, proving exactly why Taylor didn't want him in control to begin with. In 2019, Taylor Swift was honored with the Artist of the Decade Award at the American Music Awards, where she planned to perform some of her biggest hits from her early career. But Scooter Braun and Big Machine Records were legally bullying her and trying to prevent her from performing songs that they owned, out of spite that she hadn't resigned with them. Taylor claimed that Scott and Scooter Braun told her that she's, not allowed to perform my old songs on television because they claim that would be re-recording my music before I'm allowed to next year. Scott Borchetta told my team that they'll allow me to use my music only if I do these things. If I agree to not re-record copycat versions of my songs next year, which is something I'm both legally allowed to do and looking forward to do. And also told my team that I need to stop talking about him and Scooter Braun. The message being sent to me is very clear. Basically, be a good little girl and shut up or you'll be punished. While we don't have the exact NDA, we were able to track down some proof that Scooter has requested similar gag order NDAs from Taylor in the past that would have required Taylor and her publicist to not speak about Scooter or his investors at all. Fortunately, Taylor's lawyer squashed this request and Taylor called upon the forces of the internet and her Swifties to be able to perform her music at the AMAs. And the internet did what it does best. Millions of Swifties assembled and helped fight the evil label. We the people will not be denied a Taylor Swift performance. So now that we understand why Taylor Swift is on a mission to re-record her old album, let's get into how copyright law works and how she is legally able to do this. So what is copyright law? There are two main types of copyright when dealing with music. One, musical composition copyright. Two, sound recording copyright. Musical compositions are music or lyrics to a song or both. A sound recording or a master is a recorded performance of a song. Taylor owned the music composition license. However, she signed in the contract that she couldn't re-record these songs 
songs until five years after their release, or two years after the expiration of the contract. But after that, it's fair game for Tay. That's because according to Section 114B of the Copyright Act, it allows Taylor Swift to make a recreation of a previous song that is virtually identical as long as she makes a new recording of that song. This is why all the new songs have Taylor's version annotated at the end of each song title to show that it is in fact a new recording of a previously recorded song. It's not an infringement no matter how close she comes to sounding like the original. Swift's contract with Big Machine gave her the right to re-record all her old songs starting in November 2020. But another key factor is that Swift writes all her own songs and owns the publishing rights to them. This allows her to essentially give herself permission to cover the old songs without having to touch the masters. And because she owns the publishing rights, if someone wanted to license and Swift's music for a movie or a commercial. She could deny the request unless they used her re-recorded version. This sets Taylor up for controlling her own future entirely. Not only will she be making all the profits off record sales and streaming, she'll be able to open up more revenue by licensing her music to movies, live events, commercials, etc. And she'll never have to worry about a bully denying her the right to use her own creations. Lastly, what does this mean for the industry as a whole? This case provides several important lessons to creators and artists about the importance of intellectual property rights. More and more artists are now aware of the impact of owning or not owning their masters, and now push for contracts that would grant them more comprehensive rights over their own works, and can afford to be the master of their masters. Final tips to remember for other artists. Be careful when entering contracts in order to protect your intellectual property rights. Never rush to sign a contract before consulting a lawyer and understanding the future implications of each clause. Double check your assignment clauses and perpetuity clauses. Remember to push back on your contracts because most contracts are always written in favor of the other side. And like Taylor said, make sure you get a good lawyer. Make sure to drop a comment down below with your thoughts, like and subscribe. Thanks again for watching and don't forget, get exclusive Surfshark Black Friday deals now. Make sure to visit surfshark.deals slash lawbymike. Go to the link in the description and enter lawbymike to get up to six additional months free.